Hello, I'm Donna Blankenbaker from the University of Wisconsin, and I'm going to be speaking on pelvis and hip trauma. What we're going to do is review pelvic ring injuries, discuss acetabular and hip fractures. In the radiographic evaluation for pelvis and hip trauma, the mainstay is the AP radiograph. When we move on to CT, the examination must include the entirety of the iliac wings all the way through the lesser trochanters. Thin sections are necessary at CT, typically 1.25 millimeters with 2D reconstruction images, and 3D acquisitions may be address in order to help the orthopedic surgeon, as well as inlet and outlet views. Let's first start off with evaluation of the AP view of the pelvis. We want to look at the side-to-side -side comparison, looking at the hip articulations, looking for femoral head coverage, and looking for dislocations. If we draw a line up the medial aspect of the proximal femur, we should see that line extend out to involve the inferior portion of the superior pubic ramus, and this line should be nice and smooth in contour, which can help you to assess for fractures or dislocation type injuries. You want to look at the lesser trochanter, the greater trochanter, which helps you to find those intertrochanteric fractures, as well as draw a line around the femoral head and along the femoral neck so you can assess for fractures in this region. Additionally, take a close look at the superior as well as the inferior pubic rami. The pubic symphysis, you can have up to one to two millimeters of offset and that is okay. If it's greater than five millimeters wide, that's abnormal. Additionally, you can look at the congruity of the sacroiliac joints, comparing right to left, looking for any widening. Another line we can evaluate for and closely scrutinize is the iliopectineal line. There should be not any discontinuities or any offsets, as well as the ischial line. Additionally, we want to look through the femoral head and find that posterior wall of the acetabulum in comparison to the anterior wall, which can help you to look for posterior wall acetabular fractures. Additionally, don't forget about the iliac wings, looking for fractures in this location. And also, when we look at the sacrum, you want to look out those curved lines of the sacral foramina. Look for smooth contours. If they're disrupted, commonly those are going to be vertical type of fractures. And then don't forget to look for fractures of the L5 spinous process, as that can be the first indication that you have a posterior ring injury that would be important to detect. Here are inlet and outlet views, which can help us to look for those rami fractures, looking for any widening of the sacroiliac joints or loss of that normal contour of the sacral foramina. Now the pelvic ligaments are important to discuss as they help with stability of the pelvis. We have our pubic ligaments, our sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligaments, our iliolumbar ligaments, our anterior sacroiliac, our interosseous, and our posterior sacroiliac ligaments. Now it's these posterior ligaments, these are the strongest, and if they're disrupted, these are typically associated with unstable type of pelvic injuries. Now let's start off with this CT 3D image just to look at our normal solid ring structurally of the pelvis. You do have discontinuities at both the sacroiliac joints as well as at the pubic symphysis. Now using this pelvic ring model with our diagram here on the right side, that if you get a break in one location, it's very common that it's going to break in at least two places. Now you can get an isolated ramus fracture, but whenever you see one break, go ahead and look for that second break because it's often going to work hand in hand. So take a close look as well. Now let's talk about the different types of pelvic ring fractures. It can be due to an AP compression force, lateral compression, vertical shear, 
as well as complex type of injuries. Now for the AP compressive force, the first point of failure is at the pubic symphysis. So this is commonly, we can see it with car accidents following a front end collision. And what occurs is that you get diastasis of the symphysis pubis, which we can see here on the radiographs. And the sacroiliac joints can book open anteriorly. And you can also have these iliac wing fractures that can occur. So multiple different types of injury patterns. Here on the CT acquisition, we can see the SI joint diastasis, the fracture of the right iliac wing. And when we look at the pelvis, we can see more distally the pubic symphysis is widened. We also have extravasated contrast representing a soft tissue injury. And in this patient, they had a bladder rupture. Now there are three different types of AP compression injuries. The first is, being, is the vertical pubic rami fractures and you have symphysis diastasis less than 2.5 centimeters. Here's an example that you can see the widening here at the pubic symphysis. The patient went on to get a CT and you can see the widening of the pubic symphysis. In type 2, the symphysis pubis diastasis is greater than 2.5 centimeters. You also get injuries with sacrospinous ligament, sacrotuberous ligament, and anterior SI joint ligament disruption. Here we can see that there's bilateral pubic rami fractures, widening of the pubic symphysis. The patient went on for CT and you can see the widening there of the anterior aspect of the sacroiliac joint. AP compression type 3, besides these other injuries, you're going to get posterior SI joint ligament disruption. In this individual, you can see marked widening of the pubic symphysis, the rami fractures, as well as widening of that left sacroiliac joint. On CT, we see the anterior widening as well as the posterior widening compared to the contralateral side. Moving on to the lateral compressive type forces that occur, those are commonly seen following a T-bone collision. So what occurs here is you can get pubic compression fractures, sacral impaction fractures, the SI joints can book open posteriorly, and here we can see on the radiograph with this type of injury, the pubic rami fractures, that inferior pubic ramus fracture, and the contralateral other side on the right, you can see the pubic fractures and then the fractures of the sacrum. On CT, we can see that sacral fracture as well as the widening posteriorly of the contralateral sacroiliac joint and as we move more into the pelvis on this axial acquisition, we can see lateral compression of the urinary bladder secondary to hematoma, and as well as we can see those pubic fractures. Now the lateral compression also has three different types. With type one, you have a horizontal pubic rami fractures and you get sacral crush or buckle type fractures. If we take a look at this AP view of the pelvis, we can see there's disruption of those normal sacral arcs as well as the rami fractures. Now type 2, A and B, with A you have posterior SI joint ligament disruption and 2B you have an oblique iliac wing fracture there. On radiographs, here we can see this type of injury. We have the right sac iliac wing fracture. You'll notice there's also a comminuted fracture of the acetabulum and then the bilateral rami fractures. With lateral compression 3 A and B, you can get contralateral sacrospinous, sacrotuberous, anterior um, SI joint disruption, and this is also called the windswept pelvis. Now, when we think about these types of injuries, it's someone that has been similar to if they've been run over by a car. You can see as you're initially getting run over, the lateral compressive force, and then as the tire moves across the body, you have an AP compressive force. Let's just look at our ring diagram. So what occurs is that lateral compression force on one side causes anterior compression 
on the contralateral side. So in this patient, you can see the SI joints can book open anteriorly, as well as you can get posterior um, opening of the sacroiliac joint, and you can get sacral impaction fractures, as in this case. In this patient, you can see there's widening of the pubic symphysis, as well as widening of the sacroiliac joint and fractures through the sacral ala. Now, the vertical shear type of injury, you're going to see vertical pubic rami fractures, disruption at the symphysis, vertical iliac and sacral fractures, sacrospinous and sacrotuberous ligament disruption, anterior and posterior SI joint ligament disruption. Now, the key is you want to look for superior displacement. Now, how do these occur? We think about falling from a height, and typically it's differential force. One leg is longer and it's going to have contact with the ground before the other side. And what occurs is you have this vertical shear injury, and then you have this shearing of the entirety of the hemipelvis that's involved. Now, on this CT3D image, we can see the offset here at the pubic symphysis, and then the injury pattern through the right sacral ala, and you know we get injury of those uh, ligaments as well. So with the vertical shear injury in this individual, we can see that the right hemipelvis is elevated to the contralateral left side, and there is offset at the pubic symphysis and widening of that left sacroiliac joint. So the key is look for that cephalad displacement of the iliac crest of the injured hemipelvis. I did put this in here as I think it's important to remember that you can get severe intra-abdominal, intrapelvic hemorrhage. The most common injury patterns that you'll see um, severe hemorrhage with are the vertical type of injuries followed by the lateral compression three and then the AP compression three. So keep that in mind and look for um, signs for hemorrhage. Now let's move on to acetabular fractures. So the workup is the AP radiograph, and all individuals that have acetabular fractures, CT is obtained, and then depending on the surgeon, they may get the Jude views, which are 45 degree oblique views. So in this individual, we can see that there is a left acetabular fracture, looking at our normal lines here, and the patient did get Jude views, and the Jude views, are, again, are right and left oblique, allow you to see the posterior wall nicely, as well as the iliopectineal lines. Now, we're going to review the classification of acetabular fractures. You can have wall fractures, column fractures, transverse fractures, and elementary fractures, and associated fractures. Now, I included this classification by Jude and Leitrinelle, and this was out of um, Dr. Branzer's article in 1999 in AJR, nicely depicting and describing these different types of fractures. When you're looking at acetabular fractures, it's helpful to look at these different classifications to help determine what type of fracture you're dealing with. Now let's start with the wall fractures. These are typically due to hip dislocations, with posterior dislocation being the most common. They have this oblique orientation on CT, and they do not disrupt the obturator ring. Now, posterior wall fractures are much more commonly encountered. Now, with our acetabulum, here's our posterior wall, and there is our anterior wall. And on CT, there's our anterior and our posterior walls. In this individual that had a posterior hip dislocation, we'll notice that the posterior wall is missing. Another acquisition, you can see there's the triangular shape of that posterior acetabular wall that has been displaced. And if you'll notice, there is an intraarticular fragment. So always look for these intraarticular fragments following dislocation injuries. In this patient who has a posterior hip dislocation, we see that small intraarticular fragment there on the left. And if we compare the right to the left side, we'll notice that there is that 
comminuted fracture of the posterior wall, but also the femoral head remains in contact with the posterior acetabulum, which has prevented reduction. Now, there are two types of femoral head fractures. You can have a shear type fracture. Most commonly, it's going to be the anterior inferior aspect of the femoral head that gets sheared off following dislocation, or you can have a compression type injury, most frequently at the anterior inferior aspect of the femoral head. And this is similar to a hill sacs impaction fracture that you get in the shoulder. Let's just look at an example here. We see there's been fracture of the femoral head and the fragment is displaced there into the acetabulum and there's also this associated um, intraarticular fragment here on the top right there. All right, transverse fractures. What occurs is you get a break in the acetabulum into the top and the bottom halves. So essentially you have this medial and lateral portions of the acetabulum. You have a sagittal orientation on CT. You do not disrupt the obturator ring unless it's an associated type. If we take a look here, we can see here's the acetabular fracture here on the right. And at CT, you can see how there's displacement into both medial and lateral halves in this type of injury. Now, column fractures, you get a break of the acetabulum into the front and the back halves. You have a coronal orientation on CT with overall predominantly cranial caudal dimension. You get disruption of the obturator ring. With column fractures, if you have an anterior column fracture, the fracture extends above the roof into the ilium and the ring fracture is located inferior or involving the lateral superior ramus, also called the pubic root. With posterior column fractures, the fractures extend into the sciatic notch and the ring fracture is typically within the inferior ramus. So let's look at the columns here. So with our anterior column, you can see that it consists of the ilium and the pubis and our posterior column extends up to the level of the greater sciatic notch. Now here's a posterior column fracture you can see extends up to the sciatic notch and involves the obturator ring and our anterior column fractures extends up into that iliac wing. And then we have a both column fracture can also occur. Now with our posterior column fracture, as in this individual, we can see the fracture extends upward into the sciatic notch and then also this patient has a proximal femoral fracture. At CT, we can also see this fracture extending up to the sciatic notch and we can see what it looks like as well posteriorly. Here is an example of an anterior column fracture. We can see the extension up into the iliac bone extending down into the acetabulum nicely depicted here on the CT examination and then from a sagittal image of how it extends down to involve the acetabulum. And you can also get both column fractures, and this is the appearance of what they're going to look for. We see both the involvement of the acetabulum, the obturator ring, and on CT we can see the fractures, which this is our anterior column fracture, and then involvement of that posterior column as it involves the sciatic notch. Looking from the side, we can see our anterior column portion and then our posterior column fracture. So some key points for identification and classification. Look at the ilioischial and iliopubic lines. Look at the posterior walls. Is there involvement of the obturator ring? Look for iliac wing fractures. And what's the orientation of the fracture line on CT? Now, now moving on to hip fractures, the mainstay is again the AP view of the pelvis. Now the key is to make sure you have an appropriately positioned AP view. Ideally, you want the hips internally rotated so it'll nicely profile the femoral head neck junctions. Now typically patients who have fractures, they do not want to be in that position so it can be limited. Now on the lateral view, oftentimes a cross table lateral view will be obtained as well of the symptomatic hip and we just need to remember our anatomy as well. So here's our femoral head. We want to make sure the contour is normal. 
and then look at the femoral neck. We can look at the intertrochanteric region as well, looking for these subtle non-displaced fractures. And then just to keep in mind, there's our ischial tuberosity, which helps us to identify which way is posterior. Now, the most common femoral neck fracture is the subcapital fracture. You can also have a transcervical or mid-cervical. These are rare, or a basy cervical, which is uncommon. Now, these femoral neck fractures can be very subtle, so mag it up, take a close look, and on this patient, you can see subtle offset there, as well as along the medial aspect of the femoral neck. In this 68-year-old woman with breast metastasis, difficult at first to determine what's going on in this patient. There's subtle irregularity there of the lateral aspect of the femoral head neck junction. If we mag that up, we can see the fracture extending to the medial aspect of the femoral neck. A different patient that came into the emergency department with hip pain after a fall. Oftentimes these patients are osteoporotic. If we take a close look at the femoral head neck junction, we see there is some irregularity. Could it be a fracture? Is it just an osteophyte? The patient underwent an MRI examination, and what we see here is an occult fragility fracture. So they can be radiographically occult. So the key is those patients that are coming in following a fall, if they're osteoporotic, then the next step is to move on to MRI for further evaluation. Now, there is a classification for femoral neck fractures, stage one being an incomplete fracture, stage two, a complete fracture without displacement and impaction, stage three is partial displacement, but part still remains, and then stage four is a displaced fracture. And I'm only going to mention one thing just in regard to the intertrochanteric fractures is the classification system that is out there is the two-part, we have a three-part and a four part. So I want to acknowledge Dr. Kirkland Davis and Ken Schreibman for providing some of the images for this talk as well as some of the animations. And I hope this has been helpful and will give you a good review of some of the injury patterns that occur and how to best assess for these pelvic types of injuries. Thank you very much for your attention.